some of the uh, yeah, points of discussions, but I would like to welcome you. Uh, perhaps we can start with Willie as our guest and to discuss further. Thank you. Uh, do you want me to deal with all those questions and then... Uh, just yeah. feel yeah. free, whichever oh, okay. point you, you feel uh, speaks to you, yeah. uh, you can pick up for discussion. Okay, okay. Um, uh, thank you very much. Um, I think <coughs> you, you forgot one thing about me which I always insist should be told, eh? that I studied law in Dar es Salaam. <laughs> So the, the, the issue of public interest litigation in Kenya actually is anchored uh, in the Constitution very, very, very clearly. The, the history of it was uh, when Wangari Madai uh, challenged uh, uh, Moi's dictatorship. There was something that, some building that they wanted to put up in the public park. And <coughs> she went to court and uh, uh, she was uh, a petition was dismissed on uh, technicality uh, the <coughs> the uh, what 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 we call uh, the local standi okay so there is a provision in the constitution actually article 22 that makes it very clear that uh, individuals can petition on their behalf they can also represent uh, you know uh, groups uh, and that one is now in the you know in in the in the bill of rights but there is also in the constitution the uh, article 1 of the constitution which uh, um, says very clearly that sovereign power uh, sovereign power rests in the people of Kenya so public interest litigation is seen also as a breathing life to you know to that particular pro, uh, provision uh, <coughs> and it's it's a uh, it's on the, on that basis uh, now that you mentioned Waiko Wanyoike that Kituo Chakatiba was 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 actually formed as a an NGO that was going to deal with public interest litigation uh, you know various aspects of it you know the they have been challenging uh, legislation from parliament that is unconstitutional and applying that is be struck down. Uh, in cases where parliament has refused uh, to pass legislation, you know, petitions uh, have also been made. And uh, <coughs> the judiciary itself, um, when I was chief justice, we created uh, a, a division of constitutional and human rights, uh, a division in the in the Supreme Court, no, in the High Court, and a lot of these petitions, uh, you know, uh, were filed there. And uh, the the Bill of Rights states clearly it's not just the violation; it's uh, threats, you know, to a violation of rights and, or subversion. Uh, of the constitution. So there's been a very robust uh, practice, you know, uh, based on the constitutional uh, uh, constitutional provisions. And uh, what has become very clear uh, in, in, in Kenya um, is that <coughs> the government, the Kenyan government uh, finds the constitution very inconvenient. So there's been situations where you get orders and then the orders are not, you know, are not obeyed. Uh, and uh, so, so, so when you, uh, you read in our papers that uh, President Ruto uh, is sending, you know, uh, policemen to Haiti uh, and then you also hear that the the, the High Court has decided that uh, uh, that 
if he does that is unconstitutional and then he proceeds to uh, to send them there uh, what comes out of the you know of, of the that particular uh, public interest litigation is actually becomes a site of struggle. You know, it's, it, it becomes a political issue now. Does the president have this power? Uh, uh, you know, what, 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 what should be done? And uh, the issue of his impeachment is anticipated and it might be taken up uh, as part of public interest uh, you know, uh, litigation. The <clears throat> but public interest litigation also, in our experience, has, has shown that that is a double-edged sword. Uh, there are people who go for those orders to subvert, you know, the rule of law. There are other people who are hired mercenaries who file you know, or cases for cartels, for example. You know, you find in the case of Kenya, uh, a lot of people filing uh, petitions on the basis of the constitutional, there's no public participation when this, uh, uh, this particular investment was okayed. Uh, so there's that, that aspect of it, which is, uh, you know, it's of, you know, a concern. But the courts are, uh, responded very nicely, I mean, very positively, by basically saying uh, public interest litigation can't be individualized. Once you go to court, you can't withdraw because the, the public interest cause of action does not reside in the, in the petitioner. You know, so uh, your name can be, with, you know, can be withdrawn, but uh, Amik, Amish Kuria and other people can just continue the uh, uh, the litigation, which is which is uh, uh, which is which is very very uh, positive because we saw uh, like there was this famous case uh, when President Uhuru and now President Ruto were uh, charged in ICC. Some people from some lawyers uh, from Jubilee, which was their party, went to court and filed is that uh, a lot of the public interest uh, litigation issues are movement issues. So it's, it's a, a very good political connection, legal connection between social movements and the public interest uh, litigation. Like during the time of COVID, there were a lot of petitions that went to court, you know, on Article 43 of the Constitution, which provides uh, for economic, social, and cultural rights. And uh, people are saying, well, uh, if there's going to be a, lo uh, a lockdown, then the right to food, which is in Article 43, you know, is our political demand at that particular time. If you are saying we should wash our hands, then the right to water, okay, you know, provide it, you know, and uh, the barakoas, you know, there were very, you know, uh, demands that actually breathe life into that article. Uh, what does it mean, uh, the right to health, you know? Uh, uh, what, what about, uh, you know, education? So that, you know, came out of uh, uh, the COVID period. And what I found interesting was how then uh, in public interest litigation, you, you, you then with the movements raise issues that in the case of Kenya, very, very, very radical because we have politics of um, division. Uh, basically, you know, ethnicity, you know, generation, uh, religion, um, uh, gender, uh, clan, uh, race, right? And and uh, recently, actually, the English Premier League, the, our lawyers, uh, 
our politicians have realized that you can still uh, get votes uh, by supporting Arsenal or the other teams that, uh, uh, you know, uh, in the English Premier League. So, so the, the, the fact that uh, that particular petition gave us uh, the, uh, a pathway to issues, to politics of issues, yeah, was, was, you know, was very, very, very important. And it was spearheaded by social justice movements and, uh, and human rights uh, um, NGOs, and they, they, they team up uh, uh, together to do this. Then there are even citizens. Uh, there's a guy called, uh, a senator called uh, Okoito Mutata, who, who is very, very uh, active on uh, uh, issues of le legislation. And somebody else called uh, uh, Muchere, who, who uh, is, is, is basically his, his uh, petitions are around Chapter 12 which is the one of finance. So he questions the, the, the Auditor General, the control of budgets, and you know, uh, tries basically to expose how a lot of investments and a lot of uh, thieving and uh, waste, you know, wastefulness of uh, resources is, is happening. Uh, the the unfortunate thing, I think, in, in the case of Kenya is that we, we don't have a political uh, party or a strong, strong united movement or even a broad, uh, uh, broad front of the left that would take, uh, would take these uh, uh, petitions and, 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 and use them for, you know, for that uh, particular purpose. Um, so, uh, I think I've covered, uh, because I had those questions, so I've, I've you know, I've covered uh, uh, some, 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 some of them, and the challenges facing the judiciary, uh, one of course is the, how quickly do you get certain, some of those cases uh, 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 hard, some are delayed, uh, others are had very, very, very quickly. Uh, I've talked about the, you know, the uh, cartels, um, and uh, I've talked about the government, uh, the division that specifically deals uh, with it, you know, and then the, uh, you know, the the challenges. There are many sites of struggle in that constitution that uh, are still, you know, to reach the courts, particularly land. Um, parliament is supposed to legislate on the uh, acreage, the maximum acreage and minimum acreage. And the uh, parliament, as you can imagine, they, they will never <laughs> legislate uh, because what that means is that uh, uh, they will be challenging the the foreign and national landowners who have uh, millions of uh, hectares of uh, hectares of land. Then it's also the uh, I've talked about economic social uh, economics social and cultural rights resources. There's a chapter on integrity, which is called, which is chapter six. If it was implemented, uh, the entire parliament will go home. Some judges will go home, uh, and definitely the the executive. Yeah, because they they've subverted that uh, you know uh, uh, particular chapter, and the resources as well. So they, they there is. Uh, a lot of those issues happening, and I was very intrigued when uh, the issue of coups came up. Uh, uh, in, in Kenya, they, they is Article 3 says that uh, any change of government 
that happens uh, by the subversion of the constitution is unlawful. Okay? But Article 1 also says uh, that sovereign power rests in the Kenyan people and they can delegate it to parliament and uh, the judiciary and the institutions and so forth. Uh, so the question has been raised as to whether that sovereign power can be withdrawn uh, from, say, the executive. And uh, it's a very, very interesting uh, issue because under public interest litigation, there is no reason why, um, uh, like the military, if they wanted to overthrow the government, they don't have to do it in the old way. <laughs> they can try the constitution where they basically say we as, a, as citizens, we are withdrawing uh, our sovereign power from so and so. And they, they go to court and they make they can make demands about new elections, about governments of national unity, and so forth and so forth. Uh, and it's something that is being discussed, I'm sure. Uh, somebody might file. It will be very, very interesting uh, uh, to see what, what happens. What is this power? Citizens withdraw it. And what are the consequences? Uh, because a lot of these constitutions, uh, the, the ones called transformative, have all these uh, abstract provisions. All right, you can read in them the liberal dimension, the social democratic dimension. There is also require, I think, for it, you know, to be uh, the constitution to be transformative. To, to, to use these provisions to uh, craft serious, serious political uh, issues that are anchored to uh, those who want, you know, to change the, uh, the you know, the government of uh, the, you know, Kenyan compradors. They're obviously not going to, to implement our constitution. They have made that clear. They have made that clear. And so even when Tanzania and others uh, come up with a new constitution, the lesson you should learn from Kenya is uh, a metaphor that we always use, that uh, the constitution can be a beautiful baby, but if you give it to child traffickers, how will it grow? Uh, so it's, it's a whole question of which leadership is going to implement that particular uh, constitution. But the jury is still out there. I think um, some of the provisions, uh, particularly public interest litig litigation, the, the whole uh, petitions that are filed, uh, the way issues are raised uh, about education, about water, I, I, I think it's uh, it's, it's, it's a, a very, very, very good transition that keeps uh, dictatorship, dictatorship in check. Thanks. Thank you very much. Um, welcome, Honorable Chande, for your insight. Yeah, let me begin by uh, uh, maybe saying something about uh, what you asked the first in terms of uh, the challenges uh, that you know the judiciary faces in terms of uh, uh, public interest uh, litigation so so i think uh, there are a number of challenges and uh, i think one is uh, has to do with uh, with mastery uh, of the subject and i think uh, this is something professor shivji uh, alluded to uh, uh, public interest litigation is a relatively new field as there are other uh, new fields. Uh, taxation uh, was new, mining, cyber, ICT, oil and gas, and so on. So what we have, uh, you could say, uh, we have a lot of good players, 
But do we have really a first 11, you know, that can win an African championship? Both to the bar and both to the, uh, to the profession. So I think you need a lot of investment in, in, in professional development in this new area. Uh, because even if you look in some of the decisions, you could say they could benefit because a judicial decision uh, is a reasoning really that is fundamental. And you say, yeah, they could benefit uh, from a comparative analysis from jurisprudence of other countries uh, and so on. So uh, I think that is an area where maybe uh, uh, poses one of, the, one of the challenge. Of course, here, yeah, I think the judiciary had uh, debated the question of whether you have a specialized division, which Kenya, Kenya has, or whether you know we still remain something within the uh, purview of each of the judges uh, of the High Court, and uh, that is still debatable because even where you have a specialized division, there are still issues in, in specialized division, and also. Uh, maybe not every judge wants to be branded uh, a public interest litigation judge. You know, we have here an economic and crimes division. Not everybody wants to be in that division full time throughout his career. So this is one of the issues in terms of how do you build specialization uh, in a court like ours. You know that uh, that I think the second limitation, of course, challenge is is a time factor because. Uh, 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 that when you rush to make decisions because of a time lag, then you lose uh, quality. Uh, you lose quality. So given the the tremendous workload uh, the judges have, you know, here uh, minimum of about 300 cases per judge. Okay, in the best constitutional course that I know. They don't decide more than 50, 60 cases a year. Here, our Court of Appeal does about 900 cases. The Supreme Court of South Africa, not more than 50 cases on the merit. U.S. Supreme Court, Canadian Supreme Court, not more than 70 or 80 cases per year. So you have time to dig in, to delve in, to do all the comparative analysis. So it's a time factor. So you want you get things, you rush out. So you have uh, a detriment to quality in terms of really the the depth of the issue. I think the other aspect is we have a uh, uh, I don't know if it's a virtue or it's a vice uh, a mushrooming of ele uh, uh, public interest litigation cases around election around election time. Uh, so what does it mean? It means that there's a lot of pressure, uh, there's a lot of, uh, uh, pol uh, not just political, but also the media, hype, and so on. So there's pressure upon the judiciary or the bench. First of all, you need very aggressive case management. Okay, and of course now in terms of uh, training that we do at the Judicial College in Lesotho, uh, and we say, well, how do you handle a hot potato? You know, in terms of your case management, in terms of how you handle the media, the judiciary has not very, uh, uh, traditionally not been very good in handling media. It's been very shy, not aggressive, and so on and so forth. So they're all issues around, around, uh, around not politicization as such, because the merit, you decide on the merit, but what goes around. Uh, you will recall, uh, I think about two weeks before the election, uh, I cannot remember the year, this question about 200 meters, being 200 meters before, uh, at the, uh, uh, you cannot be 200 meters before polling station, you get to be out of there. That's, that was it, lodged a couple of weeks before the election. Okay, and uh, and so many others, you know, uh, uh, these cases. So it's in terms of you know uh, uh, the the politicization of uh, public interest litigation, 
uh, is, 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 an, is, is a challenge. And I think the other issue which has been mentioned here, I think, is has to do with uh, the boundary line uh, or the what we call uh, deference. What do you defer to the other branches of government in terms of uh, check and balances? Do you go in or you out or when, where is the border line? And what is the litmus test for deciding this is the border line, this is not? Uh, I know the independent uh, candidate case, uh, there was more to that than this question of deference, although they had advised and so on, but, but that, that is more. But I think in the question, for example, uh, dealing with the extra account, uh, there was a debate in Parliament. Uh, there was a, a, a petition brought in uh, to halt the discussion in Parliament uh, and the resolutions in Parliament. So the, the High Court uh, deferred that issue being uh, one best decided by Parliament in terms of its uh, immunity and freedom of information and freedom of uh, so this is the boundary line i think between politics and so on i think this is is one issue uh maybe moving on to uh, uh the question of jurisprudence uh yeah i think if you look and i think this is exhibited in the very well in the well chosen uh, uh, cases in the yearbook uh, you will find that, of course, we have a disadvantage here in the sense that uh, economic, socio-economic rights uh, uh, don't have the same constitutional weight as the, the civil and political rights uh, in terms of our basic uh, 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 basic uh, duties, the act, and so on. Uh, so most of the jurisprudence is on, you say, election issues. You have criminal issues, bail and availability, death sentence, uh, the powers of the DPP, and, and so on. And on that area, you had another area about uh, administrative justice, you know, natural rights, and, uh, and so, so they are limited, really, in terms of the uh, the the areas where uh, uh, there is this development of the uh, of the jur jurisprudence, although I think there is potential uh, uh, in a number of other areas where uh, that that can be uh, de developed. I think another uh, limitation in terms of our jurisprudence is that. We, I don't know whether this is uh, relevant in many other countries. Uh, I ask myself many times, what are the issues in Tanzania that we are ideologically uh, uh, apart? Okay, because in many countries where the, the public interest litigation is really uh, strong, uh, there are fundamental issues in society. In South Africa, racism is one. Okay, but here when you look in the US, you know it's abortion, you know it's uh, gun rights, you know it's uh, federalism and uh, state, you know it's immigration, where the court will be divided always. So here in Tanzania, what are the apart from issues of poverty and so on, which affects everybody, but ideologically divided issues, you know, that we can say, yeah, these are issues should be litigated by the court, so that the court really becomes an agent of change in terms of its transformative uh, jurisprudence. So this is another thing that I think we need to uh, to look at and try to, uh, to unearth. Uh, uh, but again, I said there are a lot of opportunities that has been that have been lost in terms of where we can have an avenue 
uh, for increased jurisprudence and you ask yourself the law of marriage act 1970 the law of the child act 2009 why did it take us 47 years to challenge the the age of marriage of a girl 15 years old yeah it took us 47 years but you knew outright you know that is fundamentally wrong why because of religious issue the government itself didn't want to touch it you know and now i'm not so sure whether they changed the statute book or not and so on you know so these are issues i think there are opportunities when you look of course we uh, so that's why i think it needs uh, uh, to invest more uh, in terms of uh, uh, you know what comes before the court and what are issues that can be litigated i think there is much more that when we see what is going on i was surprised i just checked the other day how many public interest litigation cases are there now today at the main registry here there are 14 we have 5000 lawyers in dar es salaam yeah. yeah in 2020 21 20 cases 18 22 18 Okay, so as I said, there is room, you know, really to, to grow up this area because it deals with fundamental rights and, you know, and, and it has to do with, uh, uh, with enforcing the constitutional values. You know, all those basic rights, Article 12 to 29, clearly, you know, have a foundation. Uh, and so, so I think this is, uh, you know, just to kick up the discussion. Thank you. Anything you want to add before I ask the floor to ask questions, if they have any? Yes. Actually, one of the cases that I wanted to uh, flag, you know, which, is, which was also uh, came out of public interest litigation is the the, the whole issue of uh, gay rights in, in in Kenya. That you know some of the groups, gay groups, uh, went to court uh, seeking the enforcement of their freedom of association, and they wanted to be registered and. Uh, the uh, of course that you know created you know created uh, problems with the government the NGO coordination board um, um, uh, you know and we have a very homophobic society no doubt you know uh, churches you know everybody um, uh, you know saying you know no no they can't be registered but uh, the using the constitution and um, the, the the whole issue of the particular particular article, you know, the High Court, Court of Appeal, and also the Supreme Court, uh, able to say very clearly that uh, it's the article talked about any person, right? And they were able to um, to basically say yes, they could form groups, they could associate, and they even went further and and uh, looked at Article Twenty Seven, which which talks about uh, discrimination, and they basically said uh, there is uh, a provision that you can't be discriminated on the basis of sex. So they read in the word sexual, you know, orientation, um, you know, into it. And of course, you know, hell broke loose. Uh, the, the judges were uh, attacked, you know, brutally by the Roman Catholic Church, the evangelicals. Uh, 
the Anglicans uh, had their own tr problems, uh, you know, when the Archbishop of Canterbury basically said they were going to open doors, you know, uh, for, for, for gay rights. And uh, the, the Archbishop of Uganda said no, uh, it's against uh, African values and, you know, we, you, can't, we, you can't do it. So the Anglican Church, uh, even in Nairobi, it's conflicted. But the, the, I, I, I think the, 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 su the superior courts, that's the High Court, the Court of Appeal, and also the Supreme Court were able to deal with that narrow, very narrow issue of basically saying uh, when, when the Constitution says that people are entitled to their freedom of association, it says any person. It says any, 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 any person. And uh, out of that case, what has happened in Kenya now is uh, in, the, in, the, in the courts, the debate is not just constitutional, it has become theological. Okay, people are, are, are coming, you know, they coming into court and say, wait a minute, this uh, verse in Genesis, you know, 19, that talks about, you know, the, 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 the story of uh, uh, Sodom and Gomorrah, the and the fact that there were two angels that were hiding in the Lord's house and the abusers wanted to, you know, to abuse them. Uh, so uh, there, was, there was that debate of, uh, of, of basically saying, uh, but the, the, the scripture says those who are heter heterosexuals who were abusing you know, uh, everybody. And then uh, some argument that I thought was very brilliant was raised that Lord gave his virgin daughters you know, to these uh, abusers. And so the, the lawyer was saying, what, what does this say about women's rights? You know, the Bible doesn't say exactly what, uh, what happened. Uh, so there's, there's a, a new jurisprudence that is being developed that is borrowing from Islamic theologians and also uh, South Africans will be proud to know that the theology that is being used is Desmond Tutu's theology. Okay? It is that little book called God is Not a Christian. Okay? So, where it basically uh, focuses on the issue of the Creator. And one of the judges, of, I think, of the Court of Appeal basically said, uh, let's not play God, you know, let God judge. This, this idea of people coming here and saying uh, people will go to hell, you know, it's, 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 it's very, very interesting, even in terms of how you interpret the, the scriptures holistically, because people tend to take one, one verse and they interpret it out of, the, uh, out of context. So Hebrew, for example, the book of Hebrew in the New Testament has become very uh, famous because uh, uh, it's, a, it's a God's covenant with Jesus Christ. And Jesus Christ doesn't say anything about, you know, gay rights. The closest he came to is when there's this woman who was caught in the act uh, alone. I guess the man had run away. And... Uh, so, so those is uh, uh, those who without sin should be the f the one to cast you know the first stone. So there is going to be a jurisprudence that expo exp uh, ex um, uh, exposes the uh, the hypocrisy, you know, uh, of uh, some religious groups, and they are totally divided, you know, uh, about it. Uh, and the last thing that has been discussed is, uh, uh, in Kenya is that uh, who created gay people, okay? Uh, so in the scriptures, it doesn't say it's the devil, because the devil was created by God. So they are very interesting things. 
uh, discussion coming up. And uh, the other day, I was told the Anglican Church has, has, has agreed to open a church in Nairobi for queers. Um, so, you know, I, I don't know how that, you know, uh, is going to happen. Um, I'm sure if you are a Muslim lawyer, you, you think twice, you know, <laughs> uh, accepting such a brief because uh, Kenya has a federal council <laughs> where, where, where basically they can issue a fatwa, you know, on him, on, on you. So, so what I was saying, um, uh, Doctor, is um, the the these uh, the, the 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 constitutions that I talked to uh, Chaloka, Professor Chaloka Beani, who was in the in our committee of experts, he said that some of those things they did deliberately, you know, just leaving them very vague because they knew the constitution will have to be interpreted uh, holistically and left the judiciary to deal with the issue. And our constitution, in fact, has one article that uh, makes sure that judges uh, are denied their ideological biases because it basically gives, you know, uh, guidelines as how it's, uh, you know, it should be done. I thought I would uh, share that um, because uh, quite a number of things that uh, what I called sites of struggle I maybe mean, that will come out of the constitution and it's only public interest litigation that will basically uh, uh, bring them up. Thank you very much. Uh, yes, um, uh, before I just summing 